Two public corporations, CBS and Viacom, used to be controlled by the same man, Sumner Redstone. This is the subject of a book called Unscripted. Our guest is reporter James B. Stewart of the New York Times. With his co-writer, Rachel Abrams, they start in the preface of the book this way. The drama that unfolded may have occurred at Viacom and CBS, but the recent drumbeat of greed, backstabbing, plotting, and betrayal at the upper level of American business and society has hardly been confined to one or two companies or one wealthy family and its hangers-on. Viacom and CBS merged in late 2019. The new company is called Paramount Global. James Stewart, who is Ileana Douglas? <laughs> well, Ileana Douglas is um, an actress, and she may now go down in history for having blown the whistle on an incident of sexual harassment that she suffered at the hands of the then extremely powerful um, head of CBS, Les Moonves. And Les Moonves may now be best known as after Harvey Weinstein, the most prominent um, target of the Me Too movement who was forced to resign after allegations from people like Ileana Douglas and I should say many others um, became public. How did Ileana Douglas's uh, story become public? Well, she reached out to the New Yorker writer, Ronan Farrow, um, who is very well known as um, a son of Mia Farrow and Woody Allen and um, was won a Pulitzer Prize for his expose of the Harvey Weinstein scandal. And in the wake of this, um, I think it was Ileana Douglas referred to him as the patron saint of actresses. He became, you know, known for this uh, kind of reporting, justly so. And so she reached out to him and wanted to tell him about her experiences at the hands of Les Moonves. And ultimately, Ronan Farrow wrote an article in an article in The New Yorker that featured six women who claimed to have been victimized by Les Moonves. And then he did a second article in which six more came forward. Because astonishingly, part of what we explore in Unscripted is it, the first six weren't enough. You know, they, the CBS board, you know, swept that under the rug. They did not replace him or force him to take a leave of absence after that. Who was Dr. Jones? Um, Dr. Well, Janet Jones. Um, are you talking about the doctor? Janet Jones was a screenwriter. No, I was actually talking about the, the Moonves's doctor. The, the, the diabetes doctor. Yes. Yes. Well, that is one of the, um, that was not in the Ronan Farrow stories. And exactly, you know, one of the, I think, things people didn't realize was why Moonves was ultimately really forced out. Um, and a big part of it was the fact that he had an early morning appointment with a di diabetes doctor. Um, and in short order, as they were beginning their discussion of his condition and the treatment that would be needed, he, he is diabetic. Um, you know, I don't want to go into the sordid details, <laughs> I guess, in the program, but they are in the book. And um, he really engaged in, you know, pretty shocking uh, sexual behavior uh, at a, in a doctor's office at 7.30 in the morning. It's, um, I think as she later communicated to him, you know, you have a serious problem here and you better get therapy and counseling. But again, you know, one of the revelations of this whole Me Too movement is when she went to the hospital to talk about you know, what happened, what to do about it, the, the authorities were saying, well, you know, you better keep this to yourself. He's an extremely important person in the industry. He's a very important person in the community. And so we're not going to, we don't want to stir anything up. It was only years later that that incident, that in, and in the wake of the Me Too movement, that she um, 
she brought that to light. And even then, she she was bound by doctor patient privilege. She didn't name uh, she didn't name the person when, when she wrote in a medical journal about what happened. And it took some de detective work by uh, William Cohan at, at Vanity Fair, who ultimately first uh, wrote about her. Who was Christine Peters? <laughs> well, Christine Peters is a I have to say, this book is filled with fascinating characters. I mean, she's not a huge character in the book, but um, she could be probably a book in her own right. I mean, she she was married for a while to John Peters, um, and he, prior to that, had been um, involved with Bar probably most famously Barbara Streisand. He was a celebrity hairdresser. Uh, man about town in, in Hollywood, uh, but she went on, you know, having blown through that marriage, to have uh, you know a series of of prominent affairs in Hollywood, and she claimed that well, she and she had an affair with um, or Sumner Redstone that went on and off. I think she later said for something like eighteen years, um, Sumner Redstone being the billionaire the chairman controlling shareholder of, of both Viacom and CBS, now the Paramount Global Corporation. But she surfaced in the story because she was one of the people in the in the named in the New Yorker who claimed that Les Moonves had, you know, put his hands on her inappropriately at a lunch. Um, and I will say that was one of the claims that Les Moonves and his lawyers defended against the most vigorously. And I, I have to say, you know, I don't, I have no idea. It wasn't there. I don't know exactly what happened. But their argument was, why would he put his hands on Sumner Red's mistress's leg at lunch when Sumner Redstone was his boss? You know, you don't, even if you want to, you do not, you know, come on or sexually harass your boss's mistress and. That was their argument. I, I'll let listeners draw their own conclusions about that. I get it. This is a <clears throat> process question. Why is it that you can write in your book all the sordid details of the story, but when you go out and you're on this medium or any television medium, you can't talk about it? You can't use the same language. You don't use the same language. That's an interesting question. I think it's because. I assume, you know, somebody who picks up the book and reads it, um, they sort of know, shall we say, there's some adult content in there. And, you know, they know by reading the flap of the of the jacket. Um, it's it's funny, like I my my brothers, you know, my nephew read the book and I was thinking, oh, I didn't realize that at that age group you'd be reading this. but. Anyway, that's fine. He's, you know, kids can, you know, high school certainly would could, would be okay. Um, but I don't know who's listening to this. I have no idea. And um, I feel if they want to know more, if they want to know details, they can go to the book. Uh, um, but that I don't want to, you know, I don't want to tantalize people or make it seem like this is some kind of, you know, <laughs> X-rated expose. Although the Washington Post review of the book was was to me it was interesting and they said this is the the first business book that had made them blush <laughs> uh, and i thought wow that's that's kind of interesting so i know look i have a high tolerance i think readers can make up their own minds of things and there are um details that you have to know there is no gratuitous uh lurid sex in this book but i and i have to say that you know there were things that i know about that i did not put in the book because they did seem gratuitous um I don't think there's any need to know um, some of the information that we, we discovered. And part of that is because we had an astonishing trove of material. Much of it was supposed to be kept confidential, but there were confidential sources who came forward and, and showed us things, showed us text, showed us emails, showed us videos. And one of the interesting things um, is that Sumner Redstone's mansion in Beverly Hills had cameras everywhere. There was footage. There was everything that went on in that house. There was a documentary video record of it. 
And some of the things that went on in there were lurid. Um, you know, this the book has been compared to Succession, and, and it was revealed in Succession in one episode that there were cameras in the main character's apartment. And somebody said, oh, is that really plausible? I don't believe that. That's not plausible. I said, oh, yes, it is. You know, I said, this is that's taken right from the reality of what was going on at Sumner Redstone. So, you know, people who have seen these some of these videos have said they wish they had. You know, it was it was nothing they ever really wanted to see. So I try to put in enough in the book so people understand people's motives. And let's face it, something that the Me Too movement has made clear is that the boundary between personal lives and professional lives, between personal social life and business life is porous. And they overlap more than I probably ever would have realized. I actually want to spend a, a lot more time on Les Moonves, but in order for those who have never heard of Sumner Redstone, how does he fit into this book? How important is he to the story? Well, Sumner Redstone, who you know was the chairman and the controlling shareholder of all the entities that included the CBS network, the Viacom cable channels, MTV, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, uh, and the Paramount Movie Studio, was a multi-billionaire. He built this company from two drive-in movie theaters that his family owned outside of Boston into one of the biggest and most powerful media companies in the world. At his peak, he was no, unquestionably maybe the richest media mogul of his day and, and one, of the most, one of the most powerful. And he is the fulcrum around which the story revolves because we really zero in on the story in, in the later, the last years of his life. And he was in declining physical health, he was in declining mental health, and that triggered a succession-like battle to who was going to control both the corporations and the fortune that was at his disposal. And there were many contenders. Um, some of them, his biological offspring, his daughter, Sherry Redstone in particular, others, quite a cast of, I don't know what you want to call them, hangers-on, grifters, mistresses, people moving in to take advantage of his infirmity. And I think that's an extremely important part of the story and a poignant part of the story that even with as a billionaire with all this money and power, when you're in the late, late years and you're in your 90s and you're beginning to suffer, you know, health issues and mental health issues, you are very vulnerable. And maybe billionaires, even more than the rest of us, can easily fall prey, as he did, uh, to people exercising influence over him. If I understand it right, in 2006, Viacom and CBS, who were both controlled by the Sumner Redstone family, split into two yes. different companies. They got back together when? Uh, it was after um, Sherry, this is kind of giving away part of the ending, but Sherry Redstone ultimately served, secured control of the family company and the trust that controlled uh, the voting power at those companies. And I think I'd have to check the exact year. It was I've got the, I've got the I've got the date here, August 13th, 2019. OK, that makes sense. Sherry had been uh, advocating to merge those companies uh, for some time and for good reason. The, the, the entertainment world, as, as Sumner was deteriorating, was changing radically. It was moving away from the old you know, box office cable model to the streaming world. That was a, an, that's an enormous historic change in the, in the media business. And to succeed at streaming, everyone believes you need scale. You need to be a large company. So it made sense for them to, to be put back together. But she was being opposed in that by the respective chief executives who didn't want to give up any of their power. Uh, and so it was only after she gained uh, control of the companies that she then succeeded in merging them. And you know the argument could be made that they should have merged much sooner. They lost a number of years to this civil war going on inside the empire, while the rest of the, well, the Netflixes of the world, the Amazons, the Disneys were, you know, moving ahead with multi-billion dollar investments. Go back to Les Moonves. Tell us what you know about him as a person. Well, I think one thing that makes the Les Moonves 
story so interesting and to me much more than Harvey Weinstein is that he was a legendary um, programmer in the television world. He was an extremely successful chief executive running CBS. He took CBS from the number four network to being the number one rated network for 10 years and, and running. It was uh, it was really unprecedented that CBS, the way CBS under his leadership dominated uh, that programming world. And, you know, he was a former actor himself. He was uh, very handsome, charming. I mean, the, often the first word that would come to anyone's lips to ask about Les Moonves is how charming he was. And I dealt with him a number of times when he was the uh, chief executive and also found him very warm, very engaging, very candid, you know, uh, willing to willing to discuss things in a, in a frank way. So he was, unlike Harvey Weinstein, who everybody, almost everybody, you know, loathed, even though he was successful and powerful, um, Les Moonves was much loved in the entertainment community. And by the way, even today, I, you know, he has... He has many friends and supporters, and you know many people have said to me, "Look, he made he made my career, and I'm not going to turn against him." I don't really know what happened with all these women, and then this this hidden dark side began to surface. Um, and it was his efforts you see in our story, his strenuous efforts to conceal this, to cover it up, to bury it, is what really ended up getting him into very serious trouble. November 28, 2018, in the New York Times, an article, If Bobby Talks, I'm Finished. What was that about? What led you to write that story? Well, I was, I was, I wrote, I co-wrote that story with um, uh, Rachel and another New York Times reporter, because uh, at that point, Les Moonves had fairly recently been forced out. The second New York New Yorker story appeared, even though he had survived the first one, months went by, the second one came out, and the CBS board at that point, which, by the way, is one of the shocking things in the book, are the, the remarks, the texts, the emails that these board members made that are just shockingly um, sexist and uh, reveal incredible insensitivity to the views of these women. But um, nevertheless, they were on the brink of getting rid of him when the second story appeared and they rushed out the announcement and they, they got rid of him. So it looked to the outside world that the two New Yorker stories had forced Wes Moonves out of office. But sources of mine had been kind of saying to me, you know, that's not the real story. It wasn't really the New Yorker articles. It was this cover-up effort and the fact that he was being, you know, extorted, blackmailed, whatever word, I don't know, you know, it was exactly appropriate by the manager of this actress, Bobby Phillips. And so the whole headline, if Bobby talks, Bobby Phillips, who was on the record and spoke to me for this article and for the book, described a harrowing sexual assault in Les Moonves' office when she was a young, very beautiful, up-and-coming actress and he invited her in and, and there was a, a pretty horrifying encounter and she she fled and she had never talked about this but some people knew including her manager and once the me too movement got moving her ma manager who'd sort of fallen on hard times himself realized that he had tremendous leverage with les moonbez because he knew something really bad had happened with bobby phillips what was his name? And that set up this triangle where this guy, Marv Dower, is constantly calling Les Moonves, saying, you know, I don't know, you know, better find her a job, you know, better get her a part, or she might talk. And so there's this constant, all these texts, which I got copies of, they go back and forth phone calls. And the Moonves, again, here, so many times the cover up is worse than the crime. He succumbed to this and he embarked on efforts to get a role and and Bobby Phillips eventually was offered a part not one that she was attracted to and she ended up rejecting it and was furious about it but that became a pivotal issue at CBS because here this was happening in real time this wasn't something that happened 20 years ago he was using company resources um, to try to silence someone who claimed to have been a victim of his in the past and by the way he we got interview notes from him and 
he denied almost all of the allegations saying they were consensual, but he admitted that there was a problem. He admitted two problems. One, that there was a woman who had filed a police complaint against him, even though he said that was consensual, but he admitted there was a problem with Bobby Phillips, the actress. Um, but that whole cover up thing, which is a fascinating story and kind of painful to read in some ways, um, is really what did him in. As you point out in your book, over the period of time he was at CBS, he was paid $700 million. Right. As I'm reading the book, I'm thinking $700 million in a network called CBS that owns 28 local television stations that has to live under the 1934 Communications Act, which says broadcasters are supposed to operate in the public interest. And then I read that Martha Minow, dean of the Harvard Law School, where you went to school, you went to yes. Harvard, um, was on the board. And then I think about her father, Newton Minow, who said that television is a vast wasteland. I'm rambling on about this because I'm thinking to myself, how does an individual operate inside what is basically a public company with a company that is somewhat governed, supposedly, by the United States government. They got free licenses, CBS did, when Bill Paley was there. Help me out on all this. Why, why is this happening in your perspective on it? Well, um, a, a big chunk of this book, I think, explores the failure of corporate governance at CBS while all of this was going on and then, then the aftermath. And you want to talk a minute about Martha Minow, who, of course, is a significant a legal figure in her own right, the, you know, the former dean of the Harvard Law School, a very revered professor, the daughter of a very famous person in this field. When she was first, she was asked to go on the board not that long ago by by Sherry Redstone. She was she was brought in by Sherry Redstone both as a woman and someone eminently respectable who would be a counterweight to her father's cronies who were really had a majority on the board. And I thought I think there was a revealing scene soon after she joined the board. She she came on there. Moonves spoke and she went up to him after her very first meeting and said, well, you know, is there some kind of orientation for new board members? And he looked at her like, you know, what? You know, no, we don't do that. He, he dismissed that out of hand. So, you know, you could say, why didn't she do more? She was raising her voice periodically. But I think anyone who's been on any kind of board, I've never been on a profit board, I've been on nonprofit boards. You know, they're board members and they're board members. And there was an inner cadre of board members that were extremely loyal to Les Moonves. They were his key directors. And you see, they're like an executive committee. They're, they're, they have all the real power. They have the knowledge. And the women on the board, there were three. There was Sherry, uh, Martha Minow, and, and another woman director, who, by the way, is the only survivor still on the Paramount Global Board today. And they were marginalized. They were cut out of information, cut out of, you know, the behind the scenes, you know, the, the actual board member, the meetings were like Kabuki theater. It was all orchestrated and prearranged and everything was done sort of behind the scenes. And so the reality of how that governance worked and the, the way it purported to work were, were drastically different. Um, yes, L Moonves took away over 700 million and he kept all that money. I mean, there was, after he was out, he, sued to try to get an additional 120 million in severance pay that he claimed he was owed. He didn't get the 120 million. I mean, by the way, at one point until the Bobby Talks article came out, he would they had agreed they were going to give him like I don't remember the exact number, 70 or 80 million dollars, kind of a compromise. But that blew up because the people were so outraged when they read more about what he'd done that in in the court of public opinion they couldn't get away with it but he then sued for the 120 million he didn't get 120 million but they he did eventually get a pretty you know like over 10 million i think maybe it'd been 30 million uh and so he he took all that money now the regulators i'm not an expert on on that but you know i think the board could go now to the regulators and say look you know we did you know something about it too little and too late, you could argue. Um, but, you know, maybe they will take it. Maybe they, they should look more closely at 
issues of moral character for people who are running these companies that to some degree are supposed to be acting in the public interest. As a reporter, uh, I know that you don't <clears throat> won't reveal your sources, but is there any part of the, the your ability to get the emails and the texts that you could share with us as how does this something like that happen? And where did they come from originally? How did somebody else get their hands on them? Well, we had, um, as it turned out, we had two different streams, two sources. Uh, one was a confidential source who came forward and as we describe in the book, independently reached out to the New York Times so-called tip jar where anybody can write in and people monitor that, thank goodness. And she said she had information and they then handed her this source over to my colleague, Rachel Abrams, who'd been writing about Me Too issues. Separately, I had a source who was also giving me copies of um, emails and texts um, related to the, the Moonves, Bobby Phillips manager situation. Now, I, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to talk more about this in the not too distant future. But what I can say at this point is that that source who came forward, there were many rumors that Sherry Redstone was behind all of this, that she had orchestrated this, that she had private detectives, that she somehow got all this information and handed it both to The New Yorker and to us at The New York Times in order to facilitate Moonves's downfall. And I can say that is categorically false. Cherry Redstone had nothing to do with any of this. And the motive of that first source who came forward was that she was afraid all this information was going to be swept under, swept under the rug. And the reason people had copies of this is that CBS was undergoing an internal investigation. Now, this happens many times. There's some kind of whiff of scandal, alleged wrongdoing. Companies announce, okay, we're going to do an internal investigation. They do it. They People forget about it, months go by, and then finally they say something, okay, the internal investigation is over, we concluded X, and that's the last you ever hear about it. And I think this source was very concerned, this was outrageous behavior on the part of Moonves, and it was, that would be swept under the rug, that CBS had no motive to ever really let this be known to the public, and therefore felt it was in the public interest to reveal this. Sometimes, again, lawsuits generate, or potential lawsuits, generate a great deal of information being shared with different sources. And, you know, once you have someone involved in a potential lawsuit, you have someone with a motive, possibly for getting information out, trying to put pressure on someone. And I've, as a reporter, I'm always aware of those things. But the, the issue of motive is less important to me than, is it accurate? Is it thorough? Is it com complete? Is it true? And the motive can sometimes be relevant because it's an incentive for somebody to not be honest with you. But um, if they're going to somehow benefit from the information being released and the information is accurate and correct, then I'm I'm not that concerned about, you know, why they're doing it. But I am concerned that it be accurate. So in this case, we knew it was because we had two different sources with two streams of information coming and we were getting exactly the same things. How did you two divide up the chapters? Rachel I, Abrams, you and Yes, colleague. well, um, we mostly uh, divided up the reporting. Um, and uh, that was, you know, roughly, and, and Rachel was a fantastic uh, asset here. And because, you know, the, the sources, there were some sources who were I think I, Rachel and I are not only different gender, but we're different ages, different generations. Some people, I think, really related very well to her and were more natural people for her to interview. And some people related more to me, vice versa. I had more of a background in business, so stuff like boards of directors and lawyers, I'm much more familiar with that. She's, she had done a lot of Me Too reporting, so she was very sensitive to the interests of you know, women who'd been through traumatic experiences. Although not entirely, you know, I, I interviewed Bobby Phillips and she interviewed, you know, some board members. So we kind of divided all that up. And then in the writing of it, 
I pretty much did the initial drafting and then I would submit um, submit the material for her uh, to go over. And that was partly so there would be a very consistent voice. I've heard of joint authors dividing up the chapters. We didn't do that. Um, I sort of did an initial draft and she came in and weighed in on it. And, you know, we went through the usual editing process. Um, so that's how the writing worked. I want to go to page 212 and I want to read a paragraph uh, and have you put context on this. Moonves was the keynote speaker at Variety's Innovate Summit on November 29, the same day NBC finally fired Matt Lauer after weeks of rumors, where discussion of the Me Too movement swamped the agenda. Moonves says there was no question CBS had been affected by the Weinstein scandal and ensuing revelations. He called it, quote, a watershed moment. He added, there's a lot we're learning. There's a lot we didn't know. But it's important that a company's culture will not allow for this. And you go on by saying, a few weeks later, Moonves joined Hollywood heavyweights Catherine Kennedy of Lucasfilm and Bob Iger of Disney and Ted Sarandos of Netflix to form, quote, a commission on sexual harassment and advancing equality in the workplace headed by Anita Hill. <laughs> it seems to me that that when you read that, you think you live in another world. Well, that's that's hypocrisy with the capital H. Um, I guess it's the big law. I mean, the, given that what he knew, you know, I, I'll just give you one example there. We reveal in the book that there was a woman on the CBS payroll who was in the so-called office of the chief executive sat outside of you know, Moonves's office at Black Rock in New York. And her job was to administer oral sex to him. You know, he's usually at the end of the day as, oh, okay, it's better if it's the end of the day. It's like not, not interfering with the, the, the work day or whatever. I mean, that's just astonishing. That is so outrageous. Talk about culture and, you know, culture starting at the top. And by the way, you know, above Moonves was, you know, Sumner Redstone himself, who's, approach and attitude and dealings with women are utterly appalling so <laughs> you know he said culture that won't tolerate this i mean you know the culture starts with the top of the company and it could not have been worse it was astonishingly horrible and so he's joining this commission i mean I, you know you later see he did have to step down but um you know that's this is just so typical you know of of that this industry where you know they get accused of something they say okay we're gonna we're gonna do a commission and then they rope in these eminent names and you did has anyone ever heard anything from that commission since no put put your also your your uh the context on charlie rose jeff fager charlie rose Everybody knows the name. He had his own show every night, and he was also with CBS in the morning and then CBS on 60 Minutes. Jeff Fager ran 60 Minutes as the executive director. Both of them were fired. Uh, and then you have the Weinstein, and then you have Les Moonves. What in the world is going on in New York City? <laughs> and Los Angeles. Well, you know, I don't think it's confined to the world of media and entertainment. I mean, maybe it was aggravated there because you do have this sort of classic situation where you have these very powerful male decision makers and executives and you have all of these aspiring actresses you know who are trying to get parts make their way up and you know that that was leverage um and i think some many of these men took advantage of the situation. By the way, one of the interesting things we discovered um, is that a lot of the worst examples, including the the woman who was on call for oral sex, they never complained about it. They did not. They're not part of the Me Too movement. They did not come forward. The only reason we know about that is that Moonves and his lawyers disclosed it. We know the names of these people, but we didn't put them in the book because they've never publicly. Um, 
complained or stepped forward. So that, you know, a lot of this went on that was never reported. So I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. So it may have been particularly, you know, uh, fertile ground for this in the entertainment industry, but it's hardly confined to that. I mean, look at McDonald's. There they had, you know, scandalous behavior in the office of the, of the chief executive, and they're still dealing with fallout from that. There was, um, you know, there there have been plenty of other uh, major corporations where sexual uh, misconduct by the chief executive has also surfaced. So just for the audience's uh, benefit, I, I've listed a number of dates. Uh, for, Sumner Redstone is dead. He's no longer alive. Um, right. Did he you enter? In, uh, in addition to that, we talked about the the uh, um, company getting. Fager was fired on September the thirteenth, two thousand and eighteen. Charlie Rose was fired November the twenty first, nineteen seventeen. Uh, I mean, twenty seventeen. Excuse me. Uh, Moonves fired for cause on December seventh, two thousand and eighteen. Uh, you and you've written how many books? Ten, at least. Uh, this was number eleven. How have you survived this? Because all of your books, not all of them, a lot of them are about greed. Uh, you started out. We first chatted back in nineteen ninety one about Den of Thieves, the Michael right. Milken. Michael Milken's recovered completely after what happened to him. What's your take on the the world, the human condition? Well, the human nature doesn't really change. I, I, you know, I think one of the most valuable courses I had in college was, was Shakespeare. And, you know, there's, I can't say I've really run into anything that isn't kind of somewhere in, in, in Shakespeare's plays. But as a chronicler of these events, and I guess I do feel drawn to abuse of power, um, which often accompanies wealth, but not always, um and injustices uh i think it's important for chroniclers and storytellers and journalists to just keep keep at this to keep reminding people um you know again one reason i think moonves is such a fascinating character is that people are not all good and bad you know and, and indeed some of the most dangerous people mask their worst impulses with their most appealing ones um and there are plenty of examples of that in this book but if our better, if the, what is, what's the phrase, the angels of our better nature are going to prevail, we have to have these cautionary tales. And um, I think we need to see some kind of reckoning. I mean, you know, you say, oh, Milken is completely rehabilitated. Well, I don't know. You know, he was, what happened, happened. I don't think that historic record's ever going to be erased. So he was pardoned by Donald Trump, you know. I don't want that on my resume. <laughs> you know, um, I think there is a reckoning. In fact, one of the things I found very almost biblical in this story, Sumner Redstone always said he was never going to die. And God, of course, he didn't really believe that. But he told people that the one reason he didn't want to die is he feared the final reckoning. He said, I'm going to hell anyway, so I might as well do what I want now. And he said, I, he confided in one of his mistresses that he knew the reckoning was going to be harsh. And he thought, you know, he would, if there's any punishment to be meted out, he was going to get it. But in fact, his reckoning came long before he died. His, his hell was the final years of his life. You know, he's, he's crying, he's vulnerable, he's cut off from his family, he's isolated, he's in terrible hell. It's a sorry ending, but th this justice was kind of, you know, you know, meted out, not in the way he expected, uh, but it, it happened. So, in terms of my work, um, I just feel, let readers decide, but there's now, there is a historic record here. This is true, this is accurate, it's documented. This is how life works, and there's a lot to ponder there. And I hope when people ponder it, it will encourage them to think beyond their immediate impulses to greet, for being greedy and heedless and trampling on other people or skirting the law or even violating it and think about things that are more important in life. How much money did the two women that, I don't know how to describe it, I'm not attempting to get into the details of it, that lived with Sumner Redstone, 
they were not members of his family, they were not married to him. How much money did they take away from him? The, the Redstone family filed a lawsuit at one point to try to claw back a lot of the money that they had gotten from some of these are two women who moved into the mansion with him. One was his so-called fiance. She had a nine carat diamond, but they never got married. And the other was a former girlfriend. You know, was she still a girlfriend? That's a little bit murky. Anyway, they moved in the mansion with him. And the, in the lawsuit, the Redstone family alleged and documented that they had made off with over $150 million together. And there is a sequence, a scene in the book, one of the more interesting ones, where in one afternoon, they got him to wire them $90 million. They cut off all of his other communications and they got him to do it. The banker went along with it, concealed it from his estate lawyer. So they, they're they now, you know, swanning around Southern California on the eminent boards. Uh, no mention anymore of Sumner Redstone, but they are now self-styled philanthropists doling out some of this fortune. But yeah, you know, did, the, did it pay off for them? Yeah, they've got, they're rich by any conceivable stretch of the imagination. And again, I think something interesting in the book that people didn't realize, they came close to being a lot richer. They were very close to getting him to hand over control of the whole business empire, in which case they would have been the ones running CBS and Paramount and showing up at the Sun Valley Mogul Conference. So delve in a little bit of the the board activity around Moonvez's problem. Uh, who on his board were the most loyal to him and who, if any, wanted to get rid of him? Well, right from the beginning, when the, these things surfaced, uh, Sherry Redstone, who was on the board, um, heard rumors, passed them on to Martha Minow. They brought it to the committee and then the rest of the board took up this issue. They did a so-called investigation that was an absolute farce. Again, <laughs> readers can judge for their, themselves, but it was a joke. It covered it up, it swept it under the rug, said, oh, we have nothing to worry about. Um, it's very striking to me that whatever Sherry Redstone said, they didn't believe, the, man, the male CBS directors. They dismissed it out of hand. Whatever Les Moonves said, they did believe, even though there was mounting evidence to the contrary. And there was a cadre of loyalist directors that really were the power on the board. What, were their, what were their names? Go ahead. Uh, well, there, there was Arnold Kokelson was one. There was William Cohen as the former Secretary of Defense. Um, there was, um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. There was one. Was Bruce Gordon on the board? Yes, Bruce, Bruce Gordon was the lead independent director, former head of the NAACP. He was on the board, very loyal to Moonves. And then there was another one who I think was a former, um, he was a former Verizon executive as well. There was an, another executive that had a run in with Sherry. I, I, his name is escaping me at the moment. There was a, a famous scene where he, um, grabbed her by the chin and referred to her and lectured her and referred to her as young lady and she was infuriated by that and she later complained and said you know that's outrageous the way you were treating me and he said well I don't know why you're so upset I didn't treat you any differently than I treat my own daughter she said I'm not your daughter I'm the I'm the vice chairman of this company and by the way I and my father we're the controlling shareholders um, and he was fiercely loyal to Moonves and was very um, hostile to Sherry is as well. he so on they, is he on the merged board still no none of, none of these people are now on the merged uh, on the merged board but they were there was a, a small committee that took over the investigation of the Moonves allegations and that consisted of Bruce Gordon um, uh, there were three on that committee all very loyal to Moonves and it's astonishing that they just accepted um, this flimsy investigation and the conclusion. And, and Sherry Redstone was very skeptical. Martha Minow, too, was expressed some skepticism, but it was, you know, it was kind of ramrodded through. Uh, let me interrupt um, just to say that how much did it matter that these board members were making anywhere from 250000 to $400,000 a year by being on these boards? 
Well, you, those are these are cushy jobs. Not only do they make that kind of money, they get stock options, and they get invited, you know, to the premieres. They get to hang out with celebrities. They get, you know, a fancy dinner once or twice a year. I mean, most of their meetings were by phone, but then once a year they'd have a big, uh, you know, a big fancy dinner in Los Angeles or, or New York. So there were a lot of perks that came came with it. But I think. Um, you know, it, it gave them a, you know, these are, these are powerful jobs and, you know, with influence over, you know, what Americans consumed as, as culture and entertainment, uh, it gave them a lot of, of stature. So, you know, there was very little turnover on that. I think when Martha Minow joined the board, she was the first new member and I think it was 10 years and it was some very long period of time, I mean, which is, you know, Disney, for example, has now put in term limits for their directors, but, you know, these people were in there for life terms. I mean, and Arnold Copeland, I mean, the, the, we got the emails and texts from the board, and some of them are just astonishing. Like, Arnold Copeland, you know, who won an Academy Award for Platoon, he wrote an email to his board members after the first New Yorker story with six women in it, and he said, I don't care if 100 women come forward, Les Moonves is our leader and we're standing behind him. You know, that was the, that was the attitude, and it really took an incredible, you know, ultimately even, you know, Arnold Copelson. I think he was resisting till the very end, but he was probably the last holdout. Uh, they simply could not ignore the egregious behavior that was eventually proven. That unless Moonves himself admitted in the internal investigation. What is the public corporation's responsibility to the public and the law? Well, certainly they are required to adhere to the law and um, that would be a minimum there are obligations to the public there are ongoing debates about that I mean is does does a board have an obligation to the public that goes beyond maximizing returns for their shareholders that's an ongoing debate but I think at this point most boards of directors would concede that they cannot just blindly look at what's in the economic interest of shareholders and by the way, I think that's kind of a, a false dichotomy because having, first of all, obeying the law, making sure the company uh, complies with its legal obligations and that the company recognizes broader obligations to culture and society um, is good for shareholders. That is a profit making strategy in the long run. I mean, no company, no board of directors um, should have tolerated their most important function, many people say, is hiring and firing the chief executive. They can't be involved in the day-to-day -day decisions, you know, down in the company. But a big decision like hiring and firing is is their responsibility. And once they knew some of the behavior that was going on in the executive suite at CBS, it's astonishing to me that they didn't summarily get rid of someone like that. It is not in the shareholder interest to have this going on at the top ranks of a public traded company or any company for that matter. Why didn't he but those discussions do go on. Why didn't Les Moonves resign? Retire. Well, that is a, that's a very good question. I I raised that question in the book and I you know, Les Moonves has not spoken about this, so it's hard to know because he was about to turn 70. He had an eminent record. If he had left and was no longer in power there, I don't I don't know that you know much of this would have gained traction. You know, would the New Yorker have been interested in a story about somebody who was you know retired and had left? Arguably, they would have been less interested than someone who was still at the peak of his powers. But I think there were several things going on. Number one was denial. I mean, not only did he not retire, he launched this lawsuit to strip the Redstone family and Sherry in particular of their voting control, a kind of kamikaze mission that he should have known. And indeed, you can see from the, his texts and emails that he did know was threatened to expose his very dark past. But he went ahead with that. I can only conclude, and I've seen this behavior going all the way back to Den of Thieves and many other books, that some people do some very bad things. And, and with the benefit of hindsight, you think, why, why did you do that? And the simple answer is they thought they would get away with it, that they would not get caught. And even though with hindsight, it seems astonishing, for many of these people, look at Moonves' behavior, he'd been 
assaulting these women for decades and, and he always gotten away with it. And I guess he thought, you know, when, so when suddenly he didn't get away with it, that must have come as a shock. As you... uh, I think that it's power of denial and it's it's wanting to cling, cling to power. I mean, you know, people with these top jobs in, in media and entertainment, they don't really want to leave. I mean, look what's happening at Disney. Bob Iger is back after, you know, having supposedly retired and left, you know, He's back in the saddle. You know, people people love these jobs, and I, I've seen them up, you know, firsthand. That you know the the courtiers around them, the flattery, the the pay. You know, the and the pay they don't even need the money, but it's it's symbolic. You know, their their great success and importance. Why did Les Moonves's wife Julie Chen, well known to the public with her program The Talk and also appearing on CBS. Why did she issue such a positive, supportive statement right in the middle of all these re revelations? Well, that's a that's a good question and goes to, you know, there I've seen many examples of, of this where some women just blindly and loyally stand by their spouse and others you say, okay, I've had it, it's too much for me. Um, I, I can only conclude, you know, first of all, the, the, the vagaries of the human heart are, you know, not for me to judge. I, I have to assume that she believes in him. She believes that his accounts, that all of this was consensual, that the vast bulk of these allegations happened before they were married, that, um, that his behavior had fundamentally changed, they have a son together. Um, and so she believes him and she's, that's her story and she's, she's standing by it. Um, there are, there's some elements of denial in that. I, you know, I, I don't know. She's, I mean, she's very popular in Hollywood. She's very well liked. She was beloved by many in the audience. Um, but yes, she, she dug in there and, you know, she's, still does a little bit on on cbs but her you know her career essentially that came to a, a halt at the at the same time and she decided that the most important thing to her was her was her marriage go back you know, to i don't i'm in any position to judge that yeah. go back to your comment about the woman that worked for <clears throat> les Mumbez who sat outside his office and was on call for his sexual requirements is that a story that is was alive during this time or is that an old story and is she still at cbs because you know who she is i do know who she is no she's no longer at cbs um there was another woman there who worked on the payroll whose name has not been identified who had an ongoing affair with him for six years while he was chief executive that ended when he became engaged to julie chen and i believe the the woman who was on call that also stopped uh, when he became engaged uh, to Julie Chen. You're a graduate of Harvard Law School. You're on the board of your alma mater in Greencastle, Indiana, DePauw. When you're around young people, do they care about any of this stuff? And what do you tell them? Uh, I, they do. I um, and I teach so um, at Columbia. So I have. One of the nice things about teaching is I have a, a captive audience of young people uh, every week. But I, and you know, the book came out during I'm teaching this semester, and, and they a lot of them have read it. And um, it, it's true they don't. It is remarkable. I mean, they're young, and household names to us mean nothing to them. I mean, I don't think they knew the, particularly the identities of any of these characters. They know the brands. You know, they're familiar with. They're familiar with that, but. But I'd like to, I think I've, I hope I've succeeded. I mean, I try to pick stories that are not, that are, that have um, resonance that goes beyond the immediate facts. That you don't need to know who Sumner Redstone is to quickly realize you're dealing with, you know, someone who was a, a person of great wealth and power. And that the drama that unfolds tells us something more generally about human nature uh, and not so much specifically about these people. So I've been, and again, I've mentioned that my nephew 
read it. He's a he's a junior in high school. And I the ensuing conversations please me. It's not everybody reacts in the same way. Um, I've I've heard de spirited debates about does Sumner Sumner Redstone de de deserve our sympathy because of the horrible state that he fell into in the end, or was he such a horrible person that he deserved it? I think that's a healthy conversation. I'm always happy when I hear that, but it doesn't depend on knowing who Sumner Redstone was or who Les Moonves was, or even who Sherry Redstone is, although she remains a person of considerable um, power and influence in the business. There is a merged corporation, Paramount Global. Yes. How is it doing in comparison with how the two corporations, CBS and Viacom, which by the way, own Showtime and BET and Nickelodeon and some of those channels. How is the new merged corporation doing and what is Sherry Redstone's job associated with it? Um, Sherry Redstone is now the chairman, but she's, she's not involved in the day-to-day -day running of these. They each, uh, Paramount Global has its own Chief Executive Bob Backish, who runs it, and there, there's a single board of directors. I think there's no question that Sherry Redstone was right to merge these to gain scale and to gain traction in this new streaming world. But I think most people feel it's still too small. It is struggling. I mean, they've had some big successes. They had the huge box office hit, uh, Top Gun Maverick, and their Yellowstone series is a, is a big streaming hit. But um, they're up against companies way, way bigger that are spending so much money developing content that it's hard to imagine how they're ultimately going to find a profitable niche here. Uh, I mean, maybe they will, but their stock is like way down. And they're not alone in that. It's not unique to them. In fact, you could say maybe they've done a little better than some of these, these companies. But this world is still evolving and the, I think the conventional wisdom is that a handful of major players probably at this point Amazon, Netflix and Disney are going to dominate and the the Paramount Globals, the the NBC Universals, the Warner the Warner Brothers Discovery, they're in this next tier and they are going to have to find um, a more cost efficient and um, profitable way to survive. What's your experience, and this will be a last question, uh, corporations and owners and people that are chairman and all that stuff, did they move money aside in the middle of all this so that they'll never personally be hurt? In other words, if the corporation falls apart, they don't have any responsibility for it, they can walk away with their billions. That's an ongoing problem with, with corporate governance that there have been, particularly since the financial crisis, there have been efforts to, you know, what's called clawback uh, compensation in some circumstances, but th those incidents have been extremely rare. And even when they succeed, they usually just put a small dent in the fortune of, of the CEOs. And, um, you know, there was a movement that was afoot for a while to try to cure the, I mean, there's the, the problem of the highly compensated professional manager who doesn't own the company is, as you say, they take their pay, they leave, and then, you know, who cares what happens to the company. So they try to give them a lot of stock, make them an owner. But that then created these incentives to just drive the stock up, or do whatever you can. I mean, you could see that happening at Viacom. Uh, at the expense of the long-term health of the company. So even that has not really proven to solve the problem of the professional manager whose individual economic incentive differs from the long-term health of the, the company. There's no, there's no easy way to solve that except a board of directors that is much, you're going to scrutinize the behavior of the chief executive much more closely than most of them seem willing to do. And there are more women on this board now than men. Yes, the um, Sherry Redstone, I think, has made a conscious effort to both diversify the uh, the makeup of the board, and you know, which historically in American corporations is heavily, heavily male and particularly white male. And she's also diversifying the management ranks. I think uh, at Paramount Global, you know, CBS News had uh, a woman head. Uh, I think now still has a, a woman co-head. 
but there's a long way to go. I mean, I've looked at the data. Um, despite the Me Too movement, despite the Black Lives Matter movement, the there's been very, very little progress at the chief executive level in terms of diversifying either by gender or race. The details on what we've been talking about are in the book Unscripted, The Epic Battle for a Media Empire and the Redstone Family Legacy. James B. Stewart, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.